My name's Julia Thrift and I work for the Town and Country Planning Association and I'm going to be chairing this morning's session. Um, the Town and Country Planning Association does a number of things, but one of the things we do is to manage the Green Infrastructure Partnership, which is a very rapidly growing network of people and organisations who are interested in green infrastructure. It's free to join, so if you'd like to join, just get in touch with us and then you'll get a newsletter every month with updates about um, policy, funding, research opportunities. And we also work to try and influence key decision makers about the value of green infrastructure. So today is all about the value of green infrastructure and we're going to be looking specifically at the way green infrastructure can help climate-proof urban areas. Um, there are many aspects to this. Um, trees and plants and green roofs can, for instance, help lower the temperature in urban areas. Um, but today's session is going to be focusing mostly on the potential for green infrastructure to reduce um, flooding and to help manage water in urban areas. Um, as as we all know, there have been some real problems with flooding in the last few years, and um, the predictions are it's going to get worse. There is huge potential to use green infrastructure to help mitigate the effects, particularly of flash flooding. Um, water that falls on very hard surfaces rolls straight into the drains very quickly, and because of the increased um, heavy concentrations of rain, the drains we have that weren't designed for this are likely to get overwhelmed. So we have a choice here. Do we big, build bigger and bigger and more expensive drains under the ground using traditional what's known as grey infrastructure? Or can we use the potential for trees and softer green infrastructure to help slow the runoff of water into drains and prevent flooding? So there's huge potential here, but I think one of the questions is, well, how do we actually do this in practice? It's all very well knowing that this could be done in theory. So I'm delighted that today's speakers are going to explore this issue. Um, our first speaker um, is Hannah Baker, who's the Programme Manager at Groundwork London, who's going to be talking about implementing climate proofing for social housing landscapes. So um, the, this is about green infrastructure right next to people's homes, as part of people's homes and with people involved. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome our first speaker, Hannah Baker. Hi everyone, um, great to be here today. So yeah, I'm going to talk to you about a project that I was managing um, at Groundwork London uh, last year. Um, and just for those of you who aren't familiar with the organisation, um, Groundwork London is an environmental regeneration charity um, working across London with all sorts of different community groups on a whole variety of projects. We broadly operate under these three themes, but actually a lot of our projects um, sort of trans um, go across mo multiple themes, and I think this is a good example of them. Um, so this project um, is called Climate Proofing Social Housing Landscapes. Um, it's a European project funded by the LIFE programme, um, and the LIFE programme fund is a, a European Union funding scheme that funds all sorts of environmental type programmes um, over the years. Um, the project really aimed to focus on climate adaptation um, and retrofitting climate adaptation measures to social housing environments. So really thinking about um, sort of vulnerable communities and how we could reduce that vulnerability to issues such as climate change. Um, it was a partnership between Groundwork London and the London Borough of Hammersmith and Fulham. Um, and we've worked with them on a few projects before. Um, and I'll give you a bit of the sort of context in a moment as to why that partnership was formed and why they were interested in this kind of project. Um, and yeah, as I said, I worked on this uh, over the last year or so. It ran from 2013 to 2016. So we finished uh, September last year. Um, we also benefited from some additional funding from organisations like the GLA through their Drain London scheme um, and Hammersmith and Fulham themselves. So some of the key um, activities or aims of the project, um, as I said, uh, we were really focusing on uh, sort of reducing vulnerability to climate change. Um, and it was all about sort of thinking about socially acceptable and also affordable measures that could be done in existing housing contexts. Um, and we were predominantly focusing on green infrastructure, but also 
additional measures that could help to bring other benefits as well as environmental benefits to communities. So things like play features that would encourage residents to get out there and enjoy their open spaces more. Um, we also um, had employment programmes through Groundworks Green Teams, which basically help unemployed people um, learn new skills and get back into work. And they were able to implement some of the measures as well as maintain them. Um, we ran training courses, uh, not just for those green teams, but also for housing providers, both at the council and other, um, other housing providers across London. So we're helping to sort of build skills in this area and also hoping to encourage other people to, to uh, sort of implement similar schemes in their housing stock. And resident engagement was a really big part of the work that we did. So right from the beginning, involving them in the consultation stage um, of the project, right through till um, right at the end, sort of getting their feedback and uh, helping them to learn how to enjoy the spaces more. And I'll, I'll explain a bit more about that in my presentation. Um, in order to understand the benefits of those residents, we did a social return on investment exercise, and I'll come to that as well. Um, and as I said, we're really focusing on the transferability of these kind of schemes elsewhere, not just in London, not just in the UK, but obviously across Europe as well. And really just to emphasise the approach that we were taking was very much sort of integrated, multidis multidisciplinary approach to, to this kind of work. Just in terms of the context, which many of you may be familiar with, essentially, you know, the main focus on um, SUDs and green infrastructure type measures, uh, certainly in the UK now, is on new build. So there's a requirement for new developments of a certain size to put SUDs measures in place. But for existing properties, there's not. So we were really focusing on the retrofit side of things and what could be done there. So in terms of Hammersmith and Fulham, they were really keen to work on this project because, um, as you can see on the image on the right, um, the, sort of the drainage capacity um, of that borough is modelled to be particularly bad by 2050 um, and so they're really keen to um, ensure that their properties are retrofitted and that they are prepared for what what is to come. Um, so they ha the estates that we worked in um, have real problems with things like pooling on surfaces um, and on roofs, um, so certain f flooding issues as well, there's air and noise pollution. Um, and locations near uh, the river, risks of flooding there, and also the combined sewage uh, system that has potential risks to it as well. So we kind of identified that those risks led to good opportunities for um, retrofitting suds. And in addition to that, you've got things like underused open spaces, flat roofs, all the kind of things that um, give that potential as well. These are the three, this is just a, an image to show the three estates where we worked in Hammersmith and Fulham. Um, and really just to say, um, the three different estates, we chose um, quite different sizes, different in terms of the open spaces available, whether that's green spaces, hard spaces, um, how much space there was as well. Um, and really we wanted to demonstrate the kind of um, schemes you can implement in different types of housing estates. So we chose three quite different estates in order to sort of use them as examples for, for what could be done. So I'm just going to sort of briefly fly through some of the key um, stages in the project um, that we went through. Um, and then I'm just going to sort of talk about some of the impacts and the, the benefits of the project. So in Groundwork, we're really fortunate we've got an, a good sort of in-house team that's able to do quite a lot of this work and um, is also able to do work with other organisations as well. So we started off by doing surveys and analysis to sort of understand the actual sites that we were planning to operate at, what the context was in terms of existing flooding, risks that might emerge in the future, and also things like I said around the size and the sort of potential for, for, um, for SUDS measures to go in place. Um, so you can just see some examples of the sort of mapping that was done as part of this exercise. As I said, Resident engagement was a really big part of it, and I've put it here in the slides, but it sort of operated throughout the project. Um, we have community engagement officers in the organisation that led on this work, um, and a lot of what we did um, was engaging and sort of consulting with residents, but as also as part of the programme, we had a big programme of um, gardening and food growing clubs. So one of the measures that we put in place were some raised beds that then the resident groups took ownership of, and. Um, some of the estates have TRAs, so tenant and resident associations that were really enthusiastic about keeping these going. And it's been great to see actually since the project, they are still going, the residents are still using these facilities. Um, 
we had green doctor visits and green doctors are groundwork sort of energy efficiency advisors and they go into homes and help people think about how they can use less energy so we sort of built that into the project as well we trained up some residents to be sustainability champions people who were particularly enthusiastic about learning about how to um, sort of look after their local environment use less energy but also then encouraging their neighbors to do the same and we developed sort of adaptation plans or um, sort of commitments with each of the estates that they could then take forward with the council in terms of what they'd like to do to keep looking after the spaces going forward. Um, so once we'd done the initial surveys, we did feasibility assessments. So we, we tried to prioritise a long list of items, a long list of measures that could be put in place and see which ones would be most feasible, um, both in terms of their impact on the environment and in, in terms of improving climate adaptation but also things like the social benefits that they would bring as well. So we ranked measures, you really don't need to be able to see the detail of the bottom right image, but that was how we were sort of ranking measures in terms of their priority and, and which ones we put into place. And then our groundwork, our, our um, landscape team did all the design work as well. So they were able to um, come up with the designs, but we also had some external input in terms of technical review from, from, a, from an advisory group and got residents' input as well to the initial designs and, uh, to make sure that they were spaces that they would then actually use. So in terms of the implementation of the project, um, we employed contractors to do a lot of the work, but also all the soft landscaping work was done by our green teams, as I mentioned before. Um, and I've just got the next slide, which tells you a bit more about them. Um, as I said, the green teams are an opportunity for people, often people that have been out of work for a long time, um, often people who are young um, and want to learn new skills um, and we help train them up they get six month paid placements with with the organization to learn those new skills and to actually sort of get training on a on a job um, and we find that not only does this help them you know make improvements to a community but they often um, go into an employment as, as a result so um, a number of the we had 22 trainees working with us on this project <coughs> excuse me and um, I think 14 of them have gone into employment as a result, a number of them in gardening type jobs. So the skills that they've learned, they've put into use. Some of them, it's inspired them to do further study. So they've gone on to, to go and back into learning. Um, and others have gone on to do other things with groundwork, which is great. So where opportunities have emerged for them to get involved with another project they have done. Um, and it really helps to build their confidence as well. And I've got a nice quote at the end of the presentation from one of the green team trainees as well. So as I said, the green teams, as well as um, doing the implementation of the soft landscaping works, they also got involved with the maintenance of the projects initially. So on each estate, they were involved for a period of time, maintaining all the soft landscaping measures. Um, and we then ha did training courses, which I'll just explain a bit more in a moment, but we did training courses with the council and their maintenance contractors so that we could then hand over that um, responsibility after a period of time. So that's what we did. So yeah, as I said, the training. Um, for Hammersmith and Fulham, we did quite a lot of training so that they were keen to not just have this one-off example or three estates across their borough where they were doing this kind of work. They wanted to, to do this elsewhere in the borough as well. So by training the teams that would be responsible for that, both in terms of sort of the practical maintenance side of things, but also the more sort of senior management that would be involved in strategic decisions, we were helping them to hopefully um, encourage that process to start thinking about where else in the borough and I should say that Hammersmith and Fulham, before we started doing this work, were already doing some SUDS work elsewhere in the borough. There's, they've got quite a few good examples now of this kind of work, so they really are sort of, um, working to expand that. Um, so we um, did some introductory workshops with them, and then we ran a few training courses. <clears throat> and also we did two masterclasses for the wider housing sector. So that was really looking to encourage other housing providers to do this kind of work. The final kind of key element of the project was around monitoring and evaluation. So we really recognise that um, it's really important to make the business case for this kind of work and that by having a thorough monitoring process, we could help to do that. So, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> so that we could um, be able to demonstrate what the benefits are, both in terms of the environment, but also in terms of the social and economic benefits of such a project. Um, and so we worked with the University of East London, who have done quite a lot of technical monitoring work for SUDS before. 
um, and they did the sort of technical assessment for us. And then we also did, as I mentioned at the beginning, a social return on investment exercise, um, which helps demonstrate the wider value of such projects and helps you put a monetary value on, on the social benefits. So this is just some of the um, technical monitoring that we did. So um, we did some time lapse photography. We had cameras installed at key points by some of the measures in order to take photos every 15 minutes and see how um, they performed in weather, um, weather events such as big rainstorms and things like that. Um, and we obviously monitored the weather to see how that was changing. Flow meters, um, thermal monitoring, like you can see on the top right, we were understanding the temperature difference on a, a flat grey roof versus once the green roof, green roof was installed. Um, and you can see there the blue is a lower temperature, so you can see that the temperature um, that's being monitored is, is cooler. Uh, biodiversity monitoring, photographic monitoring, like on the right here. So we sort of took a whole range of approaches um, and we also did a stimulate. Uh, we did a simulated storm event at two of the estates in order to see what would happen in a one in 100 year storm because um, obviously that we couldn't wait around for that to happen. So we wanted to see how it performed. We, um, at Queen Caroline Estate, we put 10,000 litres of water into one of the swales over the period of an hour to see how it performed. And um, fortunately it performed very well, but it, um, the capacity was you know, plenty that it was able to drain away quite quickly. Um, but we sort of tested the sort of tested the performance of those measures. So just to give you an example of the kind of data that we got from University of East London, we've actually got a detailed report on our website. If you're interested in finding out more, this is just one example from it. But basically, we sort of compared control. Um, these are control green roofs at the top, um, and comparing them to the sorry control roofs that were not green, and comparing them to the green roofs um, to show the performance. And at the bottom right um, is, this, is one of the swales, so a basin um, that was filling with water in rain and it shows the performance there. Um, but essentially the monitoring um, showed us that the, the measures were all performing as expected and I've got some headline results that I'll show you in just a moment. Obviously um, for us and um, bearing in mind the funding that we had from Europe, it was really important for us to be able to disseminate the work that we've done. So our project website um, which is urban, urbanclimateproofing.london. Um, we use that to share lots of project information. We've got a, a short film about the project up there. We've got infographics to show some of the key impacts. Um, we've got things like um, case studies. So there's lots of information that we've been doing, obviously, on the website, but we've also been talking to people about it as well um, and doing wider stakeholder engagement um, at events like this and at meetings. So just in a way, this demonstrates what we've been doing more than me talking, but just to show you some of the changes that we put in place. <clears throat> so this is Queen Caroline at the top um, and on the bottom as well, and just the before and after photos to see what the impact of the project has been. And likewise, um, the top one there is also Queen Caroline, the bottom one is Richard Knight House. So as you'll see, really, these spaces were either very sort of bland green spaces or bland grey spaces that um, residents didn't really use. They might use it to walk their dog or to let their dog go to the toilet, but the, it was, there were kind of barriers to encouraging people to use them. Like, as you'll see on this one, there's a low fence. You could climb over it, but it just that was enough to stop people really using the, the spaces. And so we were trying to do things that not only would have those environmental impacts, but also get people out and enjoying their, their green spaces more. Um, and that's just on the bottom right, that's an example of some of the food growing beds that have been put in place. Um, and likewise at the top right as well, and our third estate, Cheeseman's Terrace, we um, sort of changed the play area to make it more user friendly, usable, you know, get kids out there more. And we have seen people using the sites a lot more, and also residents commenting that they've seen people using the sites a lot more. Um, Queen Caroline is, is quite open, anyone can walk through it. Um, so the sort of it, the enjoyment value is not just for the residents as well, but for people who are just walking through on their way from Hammersmith down to the river and things like that. So here's some of the like here's some of the key successes of the project um, in terms of how much surface we've um, diverted from draining directly to the sewer, how, um, the amount of land that we've improved, the rainfall retention. I mean, essentially all the rainfall that's landed on the measures has been uh, retained and diverted um, away from the storm drain systems. We engaged lots of residents, and as I said, the feedback's been really positive. So 81% of the residents we've asked um, agreed that the green spaces have improved um, considerably. 
And yeah, our, our social return on investment has shown significant financial uh, value as well. I've mentioned the green team trainees before and also the council, um, council maintenance contractors and other management staff that we worked with. So it just demonstrates some of the positive impacts of the project. Um, so last couple, last few slides, just in terms of some of the key lessons that we've learned from the project. Um, I mean, we've, we feel that this has demonstrated like the importance and the necessity of doing these kind of, um, projects in housing, social housing environments. Um, and that it can demonstrate the role that such environments can play in helping cities to adapt to climate change. So we've just done this work in three estates, but you can imagine if it's scaled up and done across uh, cities the impact could uh, potentially be huge. Um, it really demonstrated to us the importance of a multidisciplinary and integrated approach. So you can't just work with one team. I mean, we were working with the local authority and it involved um, all sorts of teams, people involved in uh, the, like the housing officers, the flood risk managers, people in highways, um, community engagement officers, a whole range of different um, teams. And of course, the residents that we worked with as well. Um, and if you're working with a housing association, then of course, there's a whole other range of uh, different teams that would be involved. Um, we really find out that communities know their spaces. They know what they want. They know why they weren't using the spaces before. They know the problems they were facing before. There was um, someone who was in a wheelchair in one of the estates who could, when it rained uh, badly, she couldn't even go out because there, were, there was flooding and like, just, you know, water pooling just outside her door. And those kind of issues we were made aware of early on and we could make sure that they were things that were being addressed. So we learned a lot from the residents in the process as well. Um, and yeah, we feel that the comprehensive approach to monitoring has really helped us to demonstrate the business case and should be useful for others as well. You know, you can look at that data and see what the project's impacts have been and hopefully use it to make the business case in you know, other organizations as well. So I don't know the uh, sort of the background for everyone that's here today, but we, when we were doing this work, we put together some recommendations for housing providers who might be interested in doing something similar. And really kind of to encourage people to think about, even if you've got the smallest of spaces, what could be done in um, a housing environment, because you don't need a huge amount of space. You might have a flat, roof that is perfect for um, for a green roof. It could be a bin store or a pram shed. It could be a garage, all sorts of things like that. We, some of our measures are just in tiny pockets of green spaces as well. So there's huge potential there. Um, we were able to identify some really good opportunities that help save money um, through the project. So Richard Knight House had a big flat roof on top of the residential buildings and uh, it needed repair, it needed maintenance, it was going to happen anyway. So as part of that process, we were able to say, well, how about let's put a green roof up there? Um, and we were able to use, because it was such a big space, use it to trial different types of green roofs so we could see which ones work best in that situation. I've said it already, but resident engagement from the start is key and the staff training side of things as well. Um, and yeah, we benefited from European funding so we could do the whole package. But of course, there's elements of this that really work well in isolation anyway. So we don't, it's not trying to put people off doing it. If you haven't got the same kind of funding that we did, there's still lots that could be done on a smaller scale. Um, so just to mention some of the resources that we've got, if anyone's interested in uh, a copy of our implementation guide, which goes into lots of detail about the kind of project that we did and the kind of work that could be done in other housing environments, I've got a few copies today, so just come and see me at the end. Um, and likewise, the training modules that we've developed for, through the project, um, we will be shortly sort of offering them to other housing providers once they're accredited. So if you're interested, just come and chat to me. So finally, just to share a couple of the quotes that we've had from people who either have benefited from the project or been involved. The top one is from one of the residents at one of the estates. George Warren, who we work with closely at Hammersmith and Fulham Council, and then one of our green team trainees. Um, and yeah, as you can see, they've already sort of benefited from the project. And I think it highlights sort of a range of benefits that people have got out of, out of the project as well. And that's it. Thank you very much for your time. And I think we'll do, we'll do questions at the end. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah. And I, I think that's a fantastic example of the way that if you invest in green infrastructure to try and achieve one Thing, at the same time you always achieve an awful lot of other benefits so had that project been just about digging bigger drains it wouldn't have had all of the other benefits that Hannah outlined 
So there are many, many reasons why you should invest in green infrastructure, but it's also really important to try and capture the um, benefits at the end and measure and monitor. So a great project. That, that project was looking at a very local level, at things that were literally on people's doorsteps. Our next speaker, Kelly Gunnell, is a PhD research student um, who's going to be talking about the implications of future climate on natural infrastructure and flooding in city watersheds. And we'll be thinking about up, upstream. How do we stop water running into cities? How do we prevent it getting there in the first place? Um, so um, we're now looking at a bigger scale. And so I'd like to welcome Kelly to come and speak. Good morning, everyone. So as Julia mentioned, this is work that I'm doing as part of my uh, PhD research project. I'm about halfway through, so it's very much a work in progress. So it's quite evident that we live in an urban age. Most of us live or work in cities. And the much touted fact is more than 50% of the global population now lives in cities. And in Europe and North America, that figures more 70 to 80%. And with ever-increasing population growth, cities are getting bigger and more numerous. And there are obviously many advantages for living in cities, but there are disadvantages too. Besides overcrowding and crime, cities are also concentrators of environmental impacts, and they are also prone to unique environmental conditions that make them particularly vulnerable to extreme events. Flooding in particular is a big issue, uh, the density of both people and infrastructure in these urban areas escalates the devastation. And under future climate, these impacts are projected to get worse. There's going to be increases in the number and intensity of heavy precipitation events. And scenes like this will become more and more common. But when we're talking about flooding, it's important to be aware of the different types of flooding. In cities, we are probably most familiar with urban flooding or fluvial flooding, which is where our drainage systems get overloaded by a particularly heavy, heavy precipitation event. However, it's fluvial flooding or flooding that we get from rivers that is the biggest problem for cities. Cities are generally located on rivers or in the downstream parts of catchments, and they will receive all the downstream accumulated uh, flood water. So for my project, I'm aiming to examine the potential for ecosystem-based adaptation to climate change using natural infrastructure. Here, I refer to natural infrastructure as how we can use nature to provide the services that we would sometimes normally associate with built infrastructure, such as dams or dikes or other storage mechanisms. And one of the ways I aim to do that is by modeling and mapping the role of rural ecosystems, so upstream, in providing flood mitigation to the world cities and how that's going to change under future climate. Um, so how am I going to do that? Uh, I began by um, dividing the parts of the landscape that store water, which we call um, natural infrastructure. So first of all, water bodies, then floodplains, wetlands, soil, and canopy, and then divided them into first brown infrastructure Brown infrastructure would be your water bodies and floodplains, and these are generally functions of topography and are quite difficult for us to change or modify. The others, we're calling those green infrastructure, and we can increase or restore green infrastructure, and so they can be the focus of conservation or management issues. So to calculate the water storage capacity of these different components of the landscape, I'm using a model called Waterworld. It's developed by my supervisor, Dr. Mark Mulligan. It's free and it's fairly easy to use and it's quite sophisticated. Um, it's essentially a hydrological modeling tool which can measure water balances, baseline water balances, at one kilometer or one hectare scale resolution. And as opposed to other hydrological modeling tools, all the data, all the inputs are already in the system. So you don't have to provide any of your own data, although you can if you want to. And as I said, it uses mostly global data sets. And um, one of the key things about it is that it can do scenarios, either for different types of land use change or climate scenarios. And I'll be showing you some of those. Um, and say so it's, it's web-based and it's fairly easy to use, um, but it is powerful. 
So for my project, I've been trialing a new component of Waterworld to measure these natural infrastructure metrics, particularly the water storage capacities of floodplains, water bodies, wetlands, canopy, and soils. And I've just shown you some of the data sets that we use to, to capture those. And um, also to show we're measuring them at sort of cubic kilometer scales. And that there are some user-defined metrics here. So um, it's not particularly, there are some assumptions based in those. So it's not particularly precise, but it does give a good idea. So I'll show you some um, results. Well, first of all, the cities that I was looking at. So we try, we're trialing it out on six cities around the world. So Guayaquil in Ecuador, Bogota in Colombia, London, Nairobi in Kenya, Chennai in India, and Jakarta in Indonesia. So some results from the water storage capacities of those cities. So if you look at this bar graph, um, I've listed the city basins. So these are basins upstream of these cities from the smallest basin to the largest. So the smallest is Nairobi, it's an upstream city, to Guayaquil. And the bars show how much water storage capacity of canopy soil, wetlands, floodplains, and water bodies. And as you can see, the largest basins have the largest water storage capacity. That shouldn't be a surprise. Um, but what is interesting is that canopy and soil across the board seem to make up the majority of the water storage capacity. Um, with floodplains next. And then some cities like Nairobi showing you know, hardly any water bodies and there tends to be very little in the way of um, wetlands. So those were showing the total water storage capacity. I've then taken the mean storage capacities to remove the effect of the basin size. And then what you can see is that Guayaquil still has the most water storage capacity, but then Chennai, even though it was a fairly small basin, is actually showing quite a large amount of water storage capacity for its basin size. And I've also aggregated the water storage capacity into that green and brown storage. And what's interesting to notice here is that almost across the board, green storage is greater than brown storage. The exception is Chennai, which has more um, brown storage than green storage. Um, what's probably more interesting is to look at the relative proportions of the green to brown. So if you look at Nairobi, Nairobi has seven times more green storage than brown storage. This is interesting because the green storage is what can be modified or changed, but also developed on. Um, so if that green storage is under threat and it's removed through development, then um, Nairobi could be in, in trouble from a lack of storage and therefore at risk from flooding. So what we also did is we looked at how much of the green storage is protected in some way. So on the left here, you can see that London, the upper London basin, has the most protected green storage at 34%. That includes um, areas like um, areas of outstanding natural beauty. But some basins, like the Guayaquil Basin, which is a massive area, only has 3.4% of its green storage is protected. And Chennai, none of it is. You know, Chennai is an area which you know, has quite a lot of monsoonal flooding. So I think that's quite interesting to flag up. Obviously, when we're talking about quite large geographical areas, it's good to see how that water storage is distributed spatially. So this is a map showing the, the London Basin. So this is um, the Thames Basin, um, the Wandle and the Lee and Ravensbourne Basin. And it's showing the areas upstream of London. And it's showing um, the areas of total storage capacity. So the areas of the green and yellow are showing areas of high storage, total storage capacity. And this map shows areas which are showing um, which storage is dominant in each pixel. So you can see that the areas which had the highest total storage relate to the floodplains. Um, so the floodplains, even though they're quite um, local, I have the most storage capacity also thought this was quite interesting to see how soil storage was greater in the northwest part of the basin, where canopy storage was greater closest in and around London. So that's showing water storage capacity, but now we have to relate it to precipitation, how much rainfall actually comes into the system. Because if there's more rainfall than storage capacity, that's when we'll get runoff and risk of flooding. And then I'm interested to see how this is going to change with projections of climate change. So. Um, this can get a bit technical, but when we look at, at climate scenarios, 
the current way to look at it is through representative concentration pathways, RCPs. And basically, RCP 2.6 is the best case scenario, which I haven't actually included in my analysis because I think we, um, there's no ways we can achieve RCP 2.6. And then RCP 8.5 is the worst case scenario where we have emissions which continue increasing all the way to the next century. So this graph is showing how uh, both water balance and rainfall is going to change under RCP 4.5. So sort of that's the best case scenario at the moment um, for my different cities. So you can see if we just start at the bottom here looking at rainfall, we can see that for pretty much all the cities, uh, city basins, rainfall is projected to increase, except for Jakarta. But if we look at water balance, which is basically all the water inputs minus evapotranspiration, we can see that um, both Jakarta and London are going to have a negative water balance. Uh, and this is over an annual time step. So you might think, well, should we be worried about flooding in London then? If if basically rainfall is only going to increase a little bit or and go negative um, in total water balance. Um, so I'll get back to that. But what we've done with this tool is we've related um, the incoming precipitation to the water storage capacity as a ratio. And if the preci incoming precipitation is greater than the storage, then we said that area is high risk. And if it's lower, then it's low risk. And then we've mapped how that's going to change under these different climate scenarios. So for RCP 4.5, this is a map showing the flood trajectory for the Thames Basin on an annual scale. So areas of red are high, where high-risk areas are going to increase, or like the dark green that we'd be interested in is where low-risk areas become high-risk areas. And you can see that pretty much for the London Basin on an annual time scale, it's mostly yellow. So basically, low risk is decreasing. So this is kind of showing that maybe we shouldn't be worried about flooding in London. If we look at RCP 8.5, the worst case scenario, yes, there's a slight increase in, in flood risk in the basin, um, but it still doesn't look particularly alarming. However, if we look at one of our other city basins, Guayaquil in Ecuador, for RCP 4.5, I would be pretty worried if I was living, <laughs> living there. Um, but as I said, these were showing on an annual time scale, when we looked at the seasonal um, time scale, this is for the London Basin, and we can see that this is showing uh, rainfall, and you can see that rainfall for all the different climate scenarios and for the different, um, sort of for the 2050s and for the 2070s, you can see that rainfall is actually gonna increase substantially in the winter months, so particularly December, January, February, and March, April, May. So what this means is that we, can, we should be targeting our flood mitigation interventions quite seasonally for quite wetter winters and drier summers. So I haven't really shown you any particular solutions at the moment. We're still getting that. But hopefully I've shown how you can use a, a simple, um, simple but sophisticated tool to indicate things like water balances, uh, water storage capacities and different climate scenarios for places all around the world and how we've shown a novel way of indicating flood risk and how that can change under different climate scenarios as well as land use scenarios eventually. And our next step will be to see how we can determine how much green infrastructure needs to be put in place, restored or maintained in these upstream areas to reduce flood risk and adapt to, to climate change. As I said, this is a work in progress, so we are very interested in engaging or well, finding stakeholders who are willing to engage with this work to help us determine how useful this is and how it could meet their needs. So if, if you're interested, and we also be running training um, sessions, workshops on the use of water world. So please get in touch with me if, if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly. And there is increasing interest in the idea of managing water across whole catchments. And uh, some of you know that the government's soon going to be publishing the framework for its 25-year natural environment plan. And um, it'll be interesting to see whether there are, there's scope there for um, applying the sort of thinking that Kelly's just demonstrated. Our next speaker is um, 
Chrissy Tinsley, who's a landscape planner with Leicester City Council. And she's going to be talking to us about climate proofing urban areas through green infrastructure, a landscape architect's perspective. So welcome, Chrissy. Right, good morning. Um, this is going to be a very different talk from the one you just heard. What I want to talk about is Leicester. I want to talk about the great work we're doing there. And I particularly want to get across the idea that we've got to work across lots of different disciplines because we've got limited land and we've got to get as many advantages from pieces of land in urban areas as we can. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Leicester. So for anybody who doesn't know, we won the Premiership. But just as there's another thing, I think it's safe to say that we're the only UK city to have found a dead king in a car park. Um, it's one of the, it's in the top 10 cities in terms of size. I mean, obviously, once you go outside London, cities shrink a lot. It's about a third of a million people. Um, it's, I think it's Britain's first totally multicultural city, i.e. Um, the number of UK, I'm going to get the figures wrong, but we're fantastically multicultural. Um, we have a very strong mayor. But the issues that face us in the city are accessibility to green spaces. We've got an average life expectancy lower than the national average. Um, and we've got some real issues about getting people out in the city for green benefits. We were Britain's first environment city. We still try and kind of claim the glory on what we're doing environmentally. We've got strong energy policies. We've got an active district heating program. Um, we've had passive solar planning as a piece of policy for over 10 years. We've got some excellent flood policies, or rather individual site flood management policies that have been in place for quite a long time. 33,000 streetlights now have LED. Um, so we're still trying to claim the glory on the environment city, but it's getting harder with cuts. I work for a city council, so there's a lot about policies, but we've got a lot of good policies in place. In our core strategy, we have a particular policy that means every single site has to look at managing its surface water within its site. It's not always easy to implement, but we've got it there and that helps us. We've got a climate change policy that includes water management. We've got a sustainable drainage guide and we're currently working on some more guidance that I'll talk about in a moment. But we build water management and suds awareness into all our policies. So whether it's green infrastructure, biodiversity action plan, whatever, we're trying to mesh everything together. Why anybody would drive a car into that and then celebrate by jumping on the top of it beggars belief. Flooding is a problem. Um, a study of key weather events in the city between 2000 and 2008 showed that there were 102 extreme weather events. And the total cost, and I know there's other costs, not just money, the total cost of the council were nearly 4 million. And that included um, damage to highways, damage to trees, loss of rental income, you know, etc., etc. The predictions are that we're going to have more erratic weather patterns. So we, in the 80s, there were lots of hard concrete flood channels built in the city. We can't keep on doing that. It's not going to solve the problem. So we've got to look at ways to manage the water and benefit the green infrastructure and also socially so that people understand what's going on and can become more flood resilient. So this is our city. On the left is a topographical survey of the city and fairly obviously there's the higher land is around the city. Most of the city is in that central area and there's a river called the River Saw that flows through it and it takes the water off the Welland and up in Northamptonshire and that all comes into the city and you can see the flood map 
on the right-hand side. I gave a presentation to councillors once trying to explain why we've got to try and manage our floodwaters in the city. And I said, if we don't manage our floodwaters in the city, Loughborough gets it. And one of the councillors said, um, that's a problem. But it is a problem. You know, we've got to try and look at where the water's coming from and try to manage it locally. So we've had a surface water management plan in existence for quite a while. And what that has revealed is you tend to think that the obvious flooding areas are near the river. But actually, a lot of these blue areas that are called our critical drainage areas are on higher land. And flooding from surface water can take place because there are obstacles to the flows of water. So you end up with water backing up and creating problems in really unexpected areas. Now, we've built this into our planning policy. So when people apply for planning, we, this is one of the critical factors on looking at how strict we should be on making sure they put good um, localised infrastructure in. We're also lucky in Leicester for having a housing scheme that's one of the oldest to have had um, SUDS within it. It's called Hamilton. It features in Syria Guidance. It was first envisaged to have a swale system way back in 1992. The first houses started getting built in about 2000. And it's good for us to be able to go back and see and do peer review and understand how it works, what works well, how it could be done better. So we've got a system of four swale corridors. Some of them are very good, some of them aren't so good, but they take the water and they take it down to a series of wetlands at the bottom of the site before it eventually reaches the brook systems that then threaten the urban areas. So what we're trying to do is slow that water, hold it in these areas, so that in times of peak rain events, we're not rushing all our water to the most um, vulnerable areas. So that's Hamilton. This is where I get angry. We shouldn't be doing this. This is so wrong. This is a former allotment site. It's on a slope like that. We've got impermeable soils. This is the open space. That's wrong. There's no way that's right. So, you know, we've got to use some common sense and not build in problems for the future. The one on the right, you know, it looks quite pretty and I'm sure you could do an estate agent's uh, photo to sell those houses. Do you know where the children play? They play on the road. That can't be right. You know, it, all I can say about that is that the engineer who designed it is now a Suds convert at last. But, you know, those kids are going to play on the road and you've got four major headwall systems. You've got a rail, totally rail green area. And, you know, we've got a shortage of land. This, would you like to buy that? You know, four or five bed executive style home, three meter drop headwall in front of it future stagnant pond. You know, get a life, this is wrong. So let's do something better. Um, this picture here I've put in, it's a little bit out of sync, but we go and see schemes. I've set up something called the Countywide Suds Group, and we go and look at, at schemes to reinforce our beliefs in what we're doing. This is a swale, and I always use that to tell people, because people think swales are uncrossable, um, kind of angular ditches. They're not. That's a swale. That's after an extreme rain event and, you know, people are standing there. There's the flood risk manager for the city. So, you know, you get these people on board, you get them to understand what good design is. So this is groundbreaking for us because what we've got here is a road separated from the footpath with swales in between and the council of the highways people have adopted it. They've adopted the swale, so that's our big achievement. It's only very newly built, but you'll see this is a swale. It's, got, it's an underdrain swale, and the footpath is separated from the road. You know, what's so scary about that? But it works. So you get an example like that, you start to get your highway adoptions guys telling me about permeable paving and, you know, going like, whoa, it's great. So you get people, you bring them along and get them excited about it. This is another scheme. Um, it was a hospital car park, that one. And they were going to do conventional drainage. 
We got them to drain to swales, create a wetland. They saved money. We got biodiversity. And now in phase two, they're extending the principles. This is working with ACO. And this is a supermarket car park. And we have got supermarket car parks in the city with permeable paving. But in this particular instance, it was thought that there were problems with permeable paving. Lots of highway movements that kind of shake out that granular fill between the blocks. Um, women's heels getting stuck in the granular blocks. Any kind of somebody suing the supermarket isn't good news. So we've got standard blacktop, but what happens is the water flows across and that turquoise diagonally hatched area goes to a 10 meter wide filter strip and we've used all sorts of proprietary products in that to make sure that we're upping the water quality. And then it continue, that flows under, and then we pick up the remaining third, which is fairly underused car parking, because it's not the car parking adjacent to the main building. And that gets picked up by a narrower filter drain. And we've got these landscapes, which I think, you know, that's, that's a supermarket. There's a big picture over there. You know, this is great stuff because we're getting biodiversity, we're getting cleaner water. It can be done. This is the largest green wall outside London. <laughs> um, and we've got a green roof there. We've got 0.27 hectares of green roof in the city. It's a very difficult one to achieve, but we keep, you know, when we get a scheme like this, we use it to tell everybody else how good these things can be. It's, um, I think it's the largest passive house construction in the UK. But this is terrific. And I think there's 17 different indigenous plants, plant types used in this. And it's all designed integrally. You know, it's not an add-on. It was essential to the design of the building. This is something I feel really proud about. We have a city centre where you've got fantastically compacted soils, made up ground, all the rest of it. So um, we're starting to put suds in as standard. We've actually done some testing and found that a lot of these made up grounds that people said couldn't possibly support any filtration at all, do support a little bit. And every time you can use something like that, it helps lower the dependence on traditional drainage. So this was our first ever scheme. This is called Applegate. And all this is, is a linear trench. And we use proprietary systems where we could afford them. Because I was having to make a case to the council as to why they should spend an extra 17,000 pounds. And um, they said they would spend an extra seven. So we did this as a test to see how it worked. So we filled in between with gabions, got proprietary systems here. The water flows down and then is collected at the end by a traditional system. But what it did is quite low key, but it got highway design engineers excited about the principles of using suds in the city. So you start to get these mutual benefits. The trees and woodlands people are really pleased because at last their trees have got some space to actually grow. Traditionally, they were putting manhole rings. Um, so the one on the right I've included, um, it was still being constructed, but that was August the 8th and a couple of years back and it was a heavy heavy downpour and as you can see where we've got our permeable resin bound the water goes through so there are other benefits to permeable paving in that you start to have drier drier streets but we're now as a council in the city we're looking to do this sort of thing as the norm it's nothing strange we're now doing this as the norm this is great this isn't this isn't quite finished yet um this was the main highway, this is highway, through to Montfort University, which is a city centre university. Now what's going on with the universities at the moment is they're all competing massively to have that edge. And with De Montfort, they didn't really have an edge. It was just a city centre university with a series of buildings that didn't tie together. So what I did the initial kind of ideas and took them through consultation. And then it went out to um, Landscape Architects. So we've got a green corridor now. Um, so we still got to, in the highway, we still got to allow for emergency vehicles. It's closed off to normal through way, but we've got to allow for emergency vehicles, cyclists, all the rest of it. 
So what we got is um, a series of interlinked rain gardens right the way through. And it looks absolutely fantastic. Everybody's liking it. And nobody's realizing yet that they've got suds. So that's our, going to be our next challenge, is actually explaining to people what they've actually got. But it's become like a feature of the university. So something that is drainage is actually the way they're now promoting the university. We are looking at, with the Environment Agency, the flow routes through the whole of the city. And what we're doing is we're trying to find opportunities as we go. So this was the first sort of scheme we did. That's theoretically amenity land, but there's a line at the top that had a very steep-sided ditch that took the stormwater off the A6 and rushed it straight into the River Soar. So you had a steep-sided ditch and you had pollution going straight into the river. So what we did is we've literally built a pond that holds a 1,000 cubic meters of water and that allows the sediment to settle. It takes cleaner water into the soar and it limits flooding. This is, you know, we finished off with wildflower, meadow, margin. And you've actually improved the amenity, you've actually improved the safety of that area because the ditch you couldn't see, you could have just fallen into it. So from that work, which kind of tested how people would, re would respond to big holes suddenly appearing, um, we've looked for further opportunities. And this is in the same area. The top shows potential flooding in this area. It's an area called Belgrave. Very densely developed terraced housing with very few open spaces. So what we've done is looked at how the water flows through. And what was happening was that that bump there was creating a bottleneck so that all the water backed up back into these terrace streets, potentially. So we've actually taken away that bump, provided flood attenuation in this area. And just to stress, this is one of a series of schemes. And we've created 3,000 cubic meters storage of water, no, 10,000 cubic meters storage of water. Also built in some cycle paths, also some tree planting. So what was a fairly sterile, mown grass amenity area that people use for dog walking and not a lot else becomes something really attractive. And from that, we're building on the success of that in that the neighboring um, development area, we're working on trying to encourage innovative use of suds, which will actually suit, that's going to be um, a research park, it will actually suit the sort of development that's going to go there. The big thing we're working on at the moment in this idea of trying to spread the knowledge is working out the barriers to developers doing better suds. Basically, if developers don't think they're going to get suds adopted, then why should they waste their time trying to do them? And if things cost them time and money... So what we're working on in the city is a technical adoptions guide for suds. So we've got this idea of water flowing into soft areas, then being picked up by ephemeral wetland type features, and then going into pipe systems. And we found out that Seven Trent wouldn't then adopt. So the county-wide SUDS group went to Coventry to meet Seven Trent, and we explained what we were trying to do. So we've got Seven Trent on board, and this is adopted now. So there's our principle, but here's our first example of carriageways actually draining into soft areas. Not built yet, but it's got planning. I talked about that one over there before. You can see the underdrained swale to the side of it. This is our big scheme. Again, we, we've got a wetland, and we were going to end up with some huge pipe going in and a huge headwall and a concrete apron. This isn't what we want to see with wetlands. We want natural spaces that people want to spend time at. We don't want to create areas where if a child falls, they crack their head open. So we talked to Seven Trent, and we're breaking it up into a whole series of smaller pipes, and we've got at-grade outfalls. So we've got something that looks reasonably natural. We've worked with our parks people because where we're going to have we're going to have to use our soft land to form storage for water. And we're going to have to talk to the people who are going to maintain them. So we've got the top there shows our principles, what we will adopt 
if they come in with that sort of thing. And below is an example of one of the pond systems that's going to be adopted. I'm nearly there. Um, uh, here's another innovative one. So we've got a whole series of water holding areas. This one very temporary that can be used for informal play. This one stronger on biodiversity and that one on our real water holding. We've actually got some rain gardens through the housing as well. So we're starting to get there. This is my last slide. It's very, very simple. But if you can explain to people what this water management's all about, and what we've done there is disconnected a downpipe, created a rain garden, but we've involved children. And hopefully, you know, they're the future. If they can understand the principles, if they can get direct benefits, then that's what it's all about.